On today's show, 82 and 80. The 2023 San Diego Padres season is finished. It was a season of mostly nightmarish sort of sleep paralysis demons attacking us at every moment. But we're going to talk about it, pouring one out, off-season plans, what comes next. And yes, I'm wearing the hat again. Let's get to it. You are Locked On Padres. Your daily San Diego Padres podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of Locked Out Padres Podcast, which is part of the Locked Out Podcast Network, your team every day for Monday, October 2nd. As always, I'm your host with sometimes, occasionally, but certainly not always the most, Javier Reyes. Follow me on Twitter, of course, at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O, or at L-O underscore Padres if you prefer updates exclusively about the Padres. And that account will be more and more key, especially with the regular season now done, so you can check that out. And then Locked On Padres, if you want to see whatever fit I'm rocking, and most importantly, the return of the hat. The Jester hat is back. I retired it for a while, ladies and gentlemen, but it's back in honor of the end of the season for what was a cloud show uh, for the most part this season. We're going to talk about it a lot today, but guys, today's episode is brought to you, though, by GameTime. Download the GameTime app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONMLB for $20 off your first purchase, last-minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed over at GameTime. 82 and 80. Ladies and gentlemen, that's how the San Diego Padres finish. And it's funny that if I told you that record, if you were in a coma, if you were in the the space vessel from Interstellar and you had just arrived back to Earth and someone told you the Padres went 82 and 80, you probably wouldn't freak out, right? In a vacuum, you probably wouldn't freak out. In a vacuum of space, you wouldn't freak out. And if I told you that they missed the playoffs by only two games, that also you'd be like, oh, it can't have been that bad. But even still, and I think this was a great tweet from uh, Danny Vietti uh, the other day. The 2023 San Diego Padres have this year's Cy Young in Blake Snell, three 25-plus home run hitters, the second-best team ERA in the National League, a closer with a 1.16 ERA, the third-highest offensive F-war in the National League, and the third-fewest errors in the National League. And they were just eliminated for playoff contention as, let me for the record, they were eliminated on Saturday. Or, hold on, what was it? Was Saturday or Friday? I think it was Friday. I'm like 90% sure it was Friday. I'm blanking. But anyway. And those are just some of the numbers. As a team, they had good overall numbers this year. Not the best that you would have wanted. Don't get me wrong. But there are teams that were worse. Uh, In terms of batting average, they were 19th. And I think that batting average is a stat that isn't usually one that you associate with the most success these days. Right? And if you want to go by that, that's fine. I I totally agree with that. But it is. it does tell you the story about their inability to just get you hits in timely situations, that batting average stat. But in terms of on-base percentage, they finished 7th, runs scored 13th, home runs 13th, slugging percentage 15th, and then ERA as a team, uh, 3rd in all of baseball, and then batting average against 4th, walks plus hits per inning was at 12, uh, whip was at 12th, but even still, those are not that many, That's those aren't bad numbers. Uh, In fact, the most shocking number of all for the Padres is the fact that they finished with a positive run differential of plus 103, And so did the Chicago Cubs. And the teams that vaulted over the Padres and the Cubs had a run differential of negative 52, which is the Miami Marlins, and the Arizona Diamondbacks with a negative 8. Here's the thing. Run differential often does portend of things getting better, but it can often be a stat that doesn't take everything. It it takes things out of, uh, uh, not in context, right? And the thing with the Padres is that all year, this was a team that when you were up by four, they would score four more. If you're up by... Three in the ninth inning, they'd score you two more, et cetera, et cetera. But if you were down by one, if you got down early, they would just absolutely be dead. And that was kind of the story with the Padres all season. Awful with runners in scoring position. They had the worst WRC plus in high leverage situations among all qualified teams this year. They were 26 with runners in scoring position in terms of batting average. Really, really bad stuff. So even if you went by high leverage or runners in scoring, whatever it was, they were terrible. Um, and there's too many instances to think of. Right. Like I think of when they had this late run 
towards the end of the season, albeit it would have taken a miracle, I thought that it was extremely poignant. Not only do they lose to the Giants last weekend, but they lose in extras after getting like multiple double plays. I think that that was a great uh, microcosm for the season when it was bases loaded, nobody out, and all they managed to get out of Bogarts, Tatis, and Soto were two strikeouts and a fielder's choice that tied the game. But even still, that says a lot. And then you have the whole hater situation. So this that that's a great example. I think a lot about Xander Bogarts' overall numbers with runners in scoring position this year. I think a lot about the walk off losses to the Giants two nights in a row. I think about frankly the Trent Grisham. Uh, this might have been two weeks ago, I believe it was when we played the Dodgers. And actually won, by the way. We didn't win this game, but bases loaded and Trent Grisham is bunting with nobody out. Like, just absolutely insane stuff. And you got a lot of different creativity this year in terms of how to lose and waste talents and waste people's time. Uh, and that's why I'm wearing the Jester hat today. The fact that they had as many sellouts they did this year, the fact that I watched on more than one occasion this team have cr- this, the crowd standing on their feet, rooting for them just to get something out of this team. They're right there with you. They're ready to go nuts. They're ready to support you. They're ready to explode. And they would hit into double plays. They'd strike out on three pitches. They would swing at dumb pitches. They would have relievers that dis- had been on a roll and inexplicably exploded at the wrong time. It was a team that had the lowest clutch gene that I have personally seen from a baseball team in a very long time. And there's there's other teams up there, don't get me wrong. You can scroll fan graphs and use their clutch rating. The Padres, though, in general, are one of the worst ones of the century in terms of clutch ratings. And you can look up all that stuff. I'll probably, I'm will probably i saving it because I'm probably going to talk about it throughout the offseason. You know what I mean? But don't have that all in front of me. But in general, that's the story of the Padres. And it's funny because this was a year. This was a season in which they had they accomplished what was perceived to be the most glaring weakness of the team, which is starting pitching. Uh, in terms of starting pitching, everyone was worried. They said, you have Snell, you have Darvish, you have Musgrove. But no one knew what was going to happen for the back end of the rotation, especially for a team that had given up a lot of farm assets. And just in general, you didn't know what you were getting out of some of their minor league arms that they still had. You know, you gave up Mackenzie Gore in the Juan Soto trade, and you brought in Michael Waka and Seth Lugo, and those guys turned out to be exemplary uh, in their roles. Absolutely phenomenal, and I think that's going to be a big question to see if they re-sign them. But th- the fact that that was the biggest question, I'd say the second biggest question was positional change-ups. That you were saying, well, Kim's moving a second. You got Bogarts, it's his first year, he's going to be at short. You got Tatis to right field. Remember when that was a question? You have that. You have um, Juan Soto moving from right field to left field. You have Jay Cronenworth moving to first base. There was a lot of questions in terms of like the positions that people were playing. And they finish up there in defense. They finish up there, I believe they finished fourth and outs above average. And they're in the top five in defenses run saved. Two very valuable metrics when judging defense. And yet, they were just nowhere to be found when it came to all the other things that I just already alluded to, which is clutch. They just had no clutch gene whatsoever. And I I said this the other day, and someone actually agreed with me in the YouTube comments. For me, and I'm not trying to get people upset, but when they were still in San Diego, that's what this team reminds me of a little bit, uh, this San Diego Padres team. Not to that extent, because the Chargers in 2010 were literally first in offense and first in defense. The Padres, basically the best thing that they were... The thing that they were best at was defense and starting pitching, but it's not like they were the best in the league at those two things. Those Chargers teams were, and they found a way to be bad because their special teams were some of the worst in the history of football. In baseball, a little bit of a similar vibe where it's like they were really good at two things, fielding and pitching, and then they had good offensive players on their team, but they were historically bad in clutch situations. That's what kind of outdid them, and that's just the San Diego sports story. You know what I mean? I don't know what's going on, but San Diego sports seem to be cursed in that respect, so that's kind of the season in a nutshell, um, and it really stinks. Uh, I was miserable covering this team all year. I tried everything. I was wearing the Jester hat. I took off the Jester hat. I changed the name of the Twitter account. I posted more memes than I ever have. Like, I tried what I could to try and... I even did a reverse jinx on Blake Snell to say that I thought he was going to have a bad start as a way of reverse jinxing them into winning. And by the way, it worked, although a lot of people got mad at me. Just type in at LO underscore Padres and find the Blake Snell tweet where I thought he was going to have a bad start. People got mad at that tweet, but they didn't understand my bit. So it, it, it left my circle, I think. But yeah, that was the story of the 2023 San Diego Padres. So we got to pour one out. It was a super disappointing team. I'm pouring one out. Pretend that I am. There we go. There's the water bottle. Um, 
one of the most disappointing teams I've watched in baseball in quite a long time. I think that the Nationals teams, when they're on the cover of Sports Illustrated, I'm thinking, let's say, 2014, 2015, around that range, when Harper gets his MVP, but then no one else shows up. Similar to us with Snell getting the Cy Young, but not really getting enough from everybody else. That's kind of the team. Uh, and it was mightily disappointing, and there's going to be a lot of changes uh, this offseason, I think. And there's a lot of questions, um, for sure. But before we dive even more deep into continuing with this ode, this uh, farewell, dare I say, to the 2023 Padres, guys, let me just take a second to talk to you guys about who we already talked about at the top of the show, the good folks over at Game Time, ladies and gentlemen. Ah, love these folks, guys, let me tell you. Look, it can be frustrated to buy tickets these days, you know, for anything, quite frankly, but for sports, like, you don't know what's going to happen, you're trying to get those last-minute deals and all that, and Game Time has you covered. And that's what I love about them, ladies and gentlemen. Last-minute tickets, flash deals, zone deals, whatever you want. Easy to find, buy tickets for every kind of event. Every kind of event. So not just sports, but say you're trying to get... I, I, I don't think it's currently happening because every sports site and every an analyst and everyone in news is talking about her a lot. So I assume that she's not on tour anymore. But like Taylor Swift tickets, you could try and get those. You could try and get Beyonce tickets. You could try and get... Lana Del Rey tickets, you can also get theater and and comedy shows too. So it's not just sports. They've got you covering everything, which is what I like. And for the visual folk, uh, they even give you like little seat views uh, so you can see what your seat's going to look like before you get the the tickets. Lowest prices guaranteed, event cancellation protection as well, job loss protection, etc. They've got you covered, ladies and gentlemen. It's fantastic. So go download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code, you guessed it, Locked On MLB for $20 off your first purchase just for listening to this free old podcast. Isn't that great? I just gave you 20 buckaroos to go spend on a, I don't know, maybe you want to go to an MLB playoff game. I don't know. Whatever. Whatever floats your boat. Uh, so again, guys, terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On MLB. You know how to spell locked, you know how to spell on, and you know how to spell MLB. Pretty straightforward for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. Game time. And we're back, everybody, here on the Lockdown Padres podcast. Be sure to check out the SiriusXM broadcast for play by play of your hometown Padres or just listen to my podcast or whatever. Love, love, love the good folks over at SiriusXM, ladies and gentlemen. <sighs> wow. I mean, it's just so funny to think about all this, but. I, that was my most calm way of describing the season. I think I did a pretty decent job at that. I don't know about you guys, but um, if you look at final numbers, if you want to get like really stat nerdy, which I'm not going to get too stat nerdy because I'd rather save that when we do our player reviews um, for the rest of the offseason. But in terms of the Padres, like when you look at some of their players, when you look at the fact that they had plenty of guys who finished with a WRC plus above 100, you have, you know, Fredo Tatis Jr. was probably, in terms of WRC plus, the most disappointing player. He finished with 113, but he was such a great defender, and he hit with runners in scoring position, and he still hit for a good amount of power. He finished with 20, 25 home runs and 29 stolen bases. I want him to be a 25 30 guy or even 30 30. Doesn't accomplish that. But in his first full season back, after surgery and after the suspension, Pretty great from Tatis. Um, you got 4.4 um, F4 from Xander Bogarts, which makes it sound a lot better than it felt like, right? Soto obviously being the top one on the team in that regard. Manny Machado, mightily disappointing season. Hashtag Kim breaks out. But there's not like anything that's like awful when you view this team in a vacuum, right? You Darvish is probably one of the only people on the pitching side of things where even that one in a vacuum, you're like, yeah, he was bad this year. Granted, there was a little bit of injury there, but pretty rough. And there's definitely plenty of relievers. We're like 3.18 ERA from Stephen Wilson, not the best in the world uh, necessarily, but pretty sharp for a relief pitcher, especially since he, this was kind of like his breakout season. But he had some some struggles. 1.79 ERA for Tom Cosgrove. So much good stuff on this team. Uh, Nick Martinez finishes with 3.43, which feels weird. I know it does feel weird, but like in a vacuum, there was plenty of good stuff uh, about this Padres team. It's just that they were in clutch, uh, and I know that I've said that a lot, but it's true. And that's kind of the entirety of the season is that they just found new ways to lose and they weren't cohesive as a unit whatsoever. Um, and it's wild because if I, again, not to repeat points too much, but if I told you that they would have those ERA stats, the starting pitching rotation would be good, that their defense would be great, and that they'd even get something out of catcher for once in Gary Sanchez and the Campuzano Hive, 
you'd probably think, oh, we won 95 games. Like, it finally happened. We, we broke the 90 win barrier that we haven't been able to get ever since AJ Preller took over. Um, but no, that doesn't happen. Um, yeah, uh, again, I mean, seriously, this was the most frustrating season. I, if you're listening to this and you want to post on YouTube or just send me a DM, send me whatever about your most frustrating moments of the season. I would love to hear back from you. I'm probably going to do an episode this offseason talking about the most frustrating season uh, moments of the 2023 Padres. Uh, and that's going to be like a lot of research, to be quite frank, because there's so many. But really, really excited for that, um, I think, uh, to do that. So please leave sub below. I might even feature them in that episode for the future. In terms of things that we have to talk about for the future, there's still a lot. Uh, by the time you listen to this podcast, there's probably going to be more reports and we're going to get at least some idea or maybe like we might even get an announcement. What's going to happen to Bob Melvin, um, who is a big question mark? Uh, the San Francisco Giants just over the weekend released or not released. They dismissed, fired, whatever terminology you want to use, Gabe Kapler, which was viewed as a little bit of surprise for a lot of people. And then there was immediately a report saying that San Francisco put, could be interested in Bob Melvin. So. Here's what I got to say for people, and I think most people are on the anti-Preller side of things. In my opinion, I am on the anti-Preller side of things as well. Um, that Melvin, don't we think it says a lot that a guy who hasn't even been fired, that we already are getting reports that every team's going to be wanting him? Doesn't that say a lot? Doesn't it? I think it does. But um, that's going to be a big thing, obviously. We have to see, and I'm, I'm just seeing from the San Diego Union Tribune via Kevin AC that Xander Bogarts doesn't want to move to first base right now, which is a an unfortunate situation because I actually don't think that Xander Bogarts should move to first base. I think he was fine defensively this year, plus two outs above average. He was a fine fielder. Kim was just all over the place, and I think that he swallowed up any potential defensive runs, saved opportunities, and I just think Bogarts wasn't forced to do too much. I thought he was a fine fielder. Not exemplary, but fine. So it's not that, and it stinks because if they moved him to first, this would be because they want Cronenworth off of first and to use him in the infield where he's going to get you a lot more value because we've seen him be excellent at second base before, et cetera, et cetera. But to me, the biggest takeaway from that, the fact that people are talking about him moving to first, is an overall reflection on poor roster construction. The fact that you might have to move this guy from a position that he's played his whole career to first because the guy that you extended for so long, he they got to put him somewhere, right? NJ Cronenworth. They can't put him at DH. First base, he's really lackluster for a first baseman. Probably the worst offensive first baseman for teams that are allegedly competing uh, that, are, that are out there in terms of competing teams. I know there's some worse ones out there. Maybe, you know, you could bring up your Oakland or maybe even like Cleveland or something like that. But in terms of just competing teams, uh, definitely the worst one uh, in terms of offense in the league. So that's a big question. But the fact that those things are already getting asked just shows you how many questions there are this offseason. Are they going to spend? Are they going to re-sign Juan Soto? That's probably the biggest overall question. Um, aside from the Melvin versus Preller civil war that might be happening as we speak, as you are listening and watching this episode, that might be happening, that might be underway. But for me, um, I also think that another big question is going to be the spending. Uh, I wrote about this recently at Just Baseball. I kind of rambled a bit. You can go look that up about the Padres, the report that they're going to be cutting on spending. That's another big question. Does that mean they're out of the run for Juan Soto? Which personally, I do not think is the worst thing in the world. It's, hold on. It's it's really bad, but because of it's really bad that they're in this situation. But given they're in this situation, I don't think it's actually awful if you decide let's reallocate our money elsewhere because we don't want to just spend on one guy because uh, we keep doing that. You know what I'm saying? But in terms of how do you get to a situation where you traded and acquired Juan Soto and he's hitting the crap out of the ball, yet you have to consider trading him, or at least you might not be able to re-sign him. That's, if that, does that make any sense? I hope that makes sense for you guys if you're listening. So hopefully that makes sense. But that's a big question. We have to see, is probably going to try and swing for another big fish? Is he going to try and package some Jackson Merrill thing to go get starting pitching help? I don't know. Are there good free agents available? Short answer, not exactly. At least not as much as last year. But, you know, Yamamoto coming from Japan is a potential pitcher that might be interesting. There's a lot to look forward to this offseason if you're just someone who wants to see what happens. There's 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 plenty. Um, but I, I think that there's a lot of questions in terms of that. And for the offseason for this podcast, um, we've got plenty of plans too. Don't worry. We are still at least, I believe it is until middle or most of December, we will be still going five times a day. How I'm going to fill up those episodes, 
That's why I was alluding to why I want to save some of my stats, right? I want to save some of my thoughts um, as time goes on, because that's going to be a little bit difficult, but there still will be a lot to report on. And again, uh, I imagine that we're going to get news about Bob Melvin soon. I think we are. Um, I am on the record. I do not want to fire him. I just... I. Th- I just said it before. I think it says a lot that all these teams are reportedly interested in him already, despite being the manager of a team that collapsed and was mightily disappointing. That shows me and should show you that a lot of teams do not view that Melvin's to blame here. Uh, And they shouldn't, quite frankly, because I don't think it's his fault. And I think that he's hamstrung and the whole throwing in Rich Hill to get his first career save, like it's just just a lot of decisions that felt like this is just out of his hands, uh, to be quite frank. So... A lot of stuff. But before we kind of uh, wrap up this podcast, guys, let me just take a quick sip of water before I tell you some more off-season plans and questions about this lovely San Diego Padres team. And we're back, everybody, here on the Lockdown Padres podcast. Oh, it's so, so good. Remember, thank you for making us your first listen every day. Free and available on all platforms. Go check out the YouTube. Go check out at LO underscore Padres. Go check out SiriusXM. You know what it is. So get on to it. Um, man. Wow. I mean, where to start? Where to start, ladies and gentlemen? Um, I just... Man. I mean, I've, already, I've laid out a lot of stats, but it's crazy. It's crazy that they had such a positive run differential. In fact, that run differential from what I'm looking at is better than like most teams in the league. Uh, most of them. It's better than every wild card team. It's better than the Phillies, Marlins, and D-backs. It's better than the Milwaukee Brewers. And it is better in terms of the American League. It's better than the Blue Jays and the Mariners, who were close. They didn't make the playoffs, but they were close. And it's also... It's, it's kind of funny. They're probably a better team than the Twins overall. I know the Twins have a plus 120, but the Twins are also like playing in a pretty bad division. They got to play the White Sox a whole bunch, so that probably inflated a little bit. But anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. Um, in terms of offseason plans, um, what I'm really looking forward to is doing player reviews. Um, we're going to be doing the, that'll be like entire episodes. So we're not going to talk about individual players on today's episode, obviously. Uh, you know, breaking down Tatis, Bogarts, Kim. Soto, we already did Darvish from a couple weeks ago. That was the only one we did because Darvish's season ended prematurely. We're going to be talking about that. You know, how does that go? What's the injury? You know, what's the update there? We're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about Josh Hader as a player review because he's fascinating uh, and might be the one that I rant the most about, to be quite honest with you. Yeah, it's like it's going to be like him and Machado are like one of the two of the more frustrating ones, in my opinion. And it's not because Hader was bad. Machado is because he was bad, but not Hader. Um so, yeah, I just think that overall we are seeing a team that needs to change things up. Um, I just think that you cannot have on three separate instances, and they got worse and worse, uh, massive disappointment. 2019, a 20, uh, 20 games below 500 or so in the second half. In 2022, or I'm sorry, 2021, uh, one of the biggest collapses in franchise history in all of baseball history. That it was the longest, I think Stephanie, or I'm sorry, not Stephanie, Sarah Langs, I believe, put out a tweet that basically said that in terms of the history of the sport in 2021, uh, that was the longest into a season that a team had like a great positive record that ended up missing the playoffs, I believe is what um, the stat was. I'm going to see if I could find it right now. Um, I put it in my recent article. Um, let me see if I could... Uh, let me see if I could find that really, really quickly, guys. My apologies. Uh, 2023 Padres. Where is it? Is it not here? Do I not have it? My gosh, ladies and gentlemen, it is just not there. Greatest collapse. Hold on. We're, we're, we're fighting it. I should have put this down before. I'm sorry, guys. I totally forgot. Yeah. the From Sarah Langs, this is back in 2021. The Padres had a share of the best record at MLB record in MLB 54 games since his season and have now missed the playoffs. That's the second most games into a season. A team that missed the playoffs had the best record in MLB since there have been multiple wildcard spots per league. Uh, since, so since 2012, uh, crazy stuff. And the most, by the way, was the 2012 Dodgers, which is hilarious, but that's just one example. 2021, everyone knows the collapse there, the arguments, et cetera, et cetera, the starting pitching falling apart, having to rally in Jake Arrieta and Vincent Velasquez, which in my opinion is an indictment on management. And then you have this year, which wasn't as much of a collapse, but just an overall disappointing season. And it was like, like four months, 
it felt like of nightmare like can you guys just go on one winning streak please you know what I mean like they did it at the end of the season and then of course they broke that winning streak in the most Padres way ever as I talked about earlier with the uh you know bases loaded nobody at top of your lineup and all you get is a fielder's choice um you have that occur right so the common denominator here is AJ Preller and if AJ Preller is allowed to hire another GM it will be his sixth that he's hired and that is basically unprecedented. It is unprecedented for GMs to be able to hire three managers. So this is going to be twice that. So again, I am very much on the anti-Preller thing. And I don't think he's the worst GM ever. I actually think he's far from it. I think he has a lot of good for him. But I just think that when you look at the overall success of this team, you cannot ignore uh, how much seems to be holding them back. We've gotten multiple reports. We got one from The Athletic and San Diego Tribune about this AJ Preller club hof, clubhouse uh, culture f- organizational dysfunction stuff. And then we also got one two years ago in 2021. So this is a common theme. If the Padres only had this season being a disaster, it would be frustrating and I'd be upset, but this wouldn't be me calling for AJ Preller and call and calling for overall uh, organizational overhaul, which is what I think that they are due for because this just keeps happening. Right. This is just what keeps happening Um, on a molecular level and uh, uh, just from a building philosophy, uh, just to make a quick football comparison, because I was watching football yesterday, too. It was Sunday, as I imagine you guys were, too. You're checking your fantasy teams. You know what I mean? I got Isaiah Pacheco of the Chiefs. You know what I mean? Puerto Rican power. That's the only reason I picked him. Um, All sorts of stuff. Right. But it reminds me of I see Bears fans. Right. I see Bears fans who were like excited about this guy named Caleb Williams, who's a top overall quarterback prospect. Uh, I, I personally don't project um, prospects anymore. I don't like to pretend that I have no idea. I have any idea what kids are going to turn out to be. For young men, I know, but kids in the grand scheme of things, in terms of football and stuff, I, I, I don't like projecting those, and I don't like acting like I know more because there are people who analyze and are scouts who know a lot more than me. Um, so I try not to do that. Like I'm not going to tell you I know for sure Jackson Barrel is going to be good or whatever. I'll bring other people on to say that but not me, Um, that there's this guy, Caleb Williams, and the Bears are a mess. They just lost yesterday to one of the worst teams of the league in the Broncos, and everyone's saying, oh, they got to take. They have now multiple shots at Caleb Williams, and this is a franchise, the Bears, that is infamous for never having seemingly an above-average offense and especially an above-average quarterback, and to me, I I see this fan stuff, and they're like, if this this next guy will be the thing. This next guy will be the thing, but they never look at the fact that, like, don't you guys think it's weird that only you specifically keep missing on quarterback? Let's say with the Jets. Same thing for the Jets. I think it gets to a point where those teams where it's like there's it, it actually statistically and just based on an average and just eventually having to work, there's no way you've missed on quarterback this many times. What I mean by that is it's an organizational thing. It's not a coincidence that the Jets, the Browns, the Raiders, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the Jets, the Browns, the Raiders, the, the Bears, that they never have good quarterbacks. That's not a coincidence. It's not just that they keep picking the wrong guy, in my opinion. That's part of it, but it's all, like the Bears, for example, passing on Patrick Mahomes famously. Like, so that's my thing. With the Padres, it's not a coincidence that they, it's not just oh wow, why didn't this guy do well for us? It's it's the players' fault. It is a big again. Manny Machado was went from being an MVP candidate to like the least clutch player in baseball this year. So that's a big thing. Same thing with Xander Bogarts, but it's just there's a common denominator here. So when you keep saying like yeah, but Soto's different or or Snell's different, you got to keep those guys. Don't get me wrong, I'd like to keep them, but there does come a point when you have to say, do we trust this regime to make the right decisions when it comes to spending blockbuster money when the best season we've had, and at least since I've been covering this podcast, is either a truncated 2020, hey, if I give the Dodgers crap for celebrating that season, I got to give the Padres crap, and a 2022 season in which they won 89 games, and they probably like overperformed their peripherals in a lot of ways. That, to me, shows you, like, I just don't think Preller's the guy in terms of completing the GM job, being a guy who can let people do their own thing and not micromanage, being a guy who makes smart major league trades, being a guy that builds out a roster that lasts 162 instead of just one that's going to hit all the Sports Illustrated cover pieces, right? You need that. As a talent evaluator, especially at the prospect sort of minor league level, he's been shown clearly to be exemplary at that. Uh, In terms of... Just having the guts to actually go for stuff. 
uh, to actually make big trades. And some of them worked out. You Darvish, I think, has worked out. Blake Snell certainly worked out. You know, Joe Musgrove certainly worked out. Tatis, certainly. Juan Soto, I mean, he's been good. It's not his fault that the team is bad. But, like, he's been great. So those things happen and... <laughs> It's beautiful. I just saw someone tweet like the Jets coach is a loser. So that's really funny. But um, that's where I'm at. That's where I'm at. I think that overall, um, this is just not a coincidence. If the, I hope that that analogy for football made sense to you, uh, where it's like, I don't think it's just we sign the wrong people or that the players are to blame. They have a lot to blame. I actually think that out of all the collapses in between 2019, 2021, and this one, I actually think this one falls the least on Preller, in my opinion. Um, just because, like, literally Manny Machado, please just drive in a run for once. That's all we're asking for. You know what I mean? Like, that, it's actually a little bit less on him, uh, in my opinion. In my opinion. But as a whole, can't keep doing this, guys. Just can't. You can't. Um, and they keep doing it. So we'll see if AJ Preller is gone. And we're going to be talking about that all off season. We're going to be talking about if AJ Preller isn't gone, which is a, certainly a high possibility, who should be the new manager? If AJ Preller is let go, we'll obviously be talking about who the new GM is, right? And who is it? I don't know. Maybe go get the guy out of Baltimore. Maybe go get the guy out of Cleveland. I don't know. If they lose the Abla too, which is one thing that's been reported that Melvin may leave and then so will Ruben Niebla, then that will be discussed. And I promise you ranted about Niebla would be like the last straw for me. That would be like I will actively start memeing and starting hate campaigns online for AJ Preller. Not really. I don't want to wish the guy oh will, but you get my point. Like I'll actively be on Twitter upset about this one. Um, I'm going to be talking about that. All sorts of things. We're going to be talking about every free agent going to be ranking my off season wish list in terms of not just players, but roster moves and organizational moves going to be doing more crossovers with my buddy Millard. We got one coming out on Wednesday. We're going to be doing a playoff sort of draft playoff field is set. We're going to draft those teams who we think is most likely. That one should be a lot of fun. I don't know about you guys, but I think that our last one was actually one of the most fun ones yet. So go listen to those. I love doing them with him. We're going to have those at least once a week. Player reviews for every key player on the Padres. Um, we might even have to do a player review or whatever of of um, what's his face? Um, uh, Bob Melvin to, a, to an extent, right? We're going to be talking about him. But yeah, it's basically it, guys. Look, it was a really bad season, and I'm so grateful for you all for sticking with me, uh, if you did, through these times, following me on Twitter or whatever. And remember, go do that, at Javipedio, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O. Um, you can do that. Like, I, I still enjoyed covering this team, um, and I'm still excited to cover them going forward. Right? Like, I ain't going anywhere. Don't worry. Your boy ain't going anywhere. Um, but I'm excited to do get a little creative this offseason. Um, you know, on top of the drafts with Millard, just try and find different things. Find, try and find different things to talk about. I'm going to not, I'm trying not to do the thing where I react to the MLB playoffs for sake of not having anything to talk about. I'm going to try my best, uh, especially into December. It's a lot of episodes I got to play now, but I really want to do it. And if you guys have anything you'd want me to talk about in specific, feel free to leave a comment or DM me. My DMs are open on my main account. Same thing for the Padres account. Don't worry about the whole, I think, what is it like you have to have a blue check in order to DM people? Something like that. Don't worry. I left mine open. Um, you can check that out. Just a lot of stuff, man. And it's crazy. And I know Soto is going to be the big one. Um, I don't know if they're going to do it. I don't know if they're going to do it. And if they trade Soto, the only thing I'll say is the fact that they're in a position in a vacuum where trading him wouldn't be the worst idea ever. That goes to show you roster management guys. So we'll see what happens. But until then, You've been listening to the Lockdown Padres podcast, the only pod that may be better than the Padres themselves. Remember to subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts from. Of course, as always, follow me on Twitter at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O, or at L-O underscore Padres. Looking forward to the offseason. Fourth season in the books. Again, thank you for everyone who sends me any sort of kind words. Really greatly appreciate it. Um, I, I never thought I would be doing this podcast in the first place. I never thought it would make an impact on my life. I never thought that I would fall in love with this team the way I did. I liked them before. I didn't love them the way I do now, despite how much they seem to hate me and hate all of us. Um, I'm really excited. And seriously, thank you. It means a lot. If you're ever thinking that I get a lot of messages or, oh, whatever, like, let me just leave. No. Every single thing you guys send to me, I appreciate it and cherish it. And I try to get back to basically all of you. Even if it's a little bit late sometimes, 
my bad to my guy. I'm going to give him a shout out because why not? Um, my guy who reached out, what's his name? Travis Myers, um, who reached out to me back in August. And I only just saw it today, August 22nd. I responded yesterday. My bad, dude. Uh, it was a message request that I missed it. But nonetheless, um, looking forward, guys. Onwards, always and forever. Until next time, stay safe. And of course, stay faithful. My Friar Faithful homies, take care.